Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain, and today I'm coming impromptu at you. I know this is our regularly scheduled time, but I was not going to do a meeting today because I just didn't know if I was going to be able to get to uh, to a place in the day where I had enough time to break away. And so I'm here at the Harvard Faculty Club. I uh, just finished up giving a presentation to the group, and uh, it was fantastic. It was a fantastic experience. I got to talk about no grain, no pain. I got to deliver the message to 180 people in the room uh, at this group. And it was just, again, it was so well received. Uh, I was very skeptical about how well it might be received up here, but it was so well received and I was so honored. Uh, and I'm super excited because uh, one of the things that happened was, and I didn't know this was going to happen, but I was actually given an award for distinguished mentor. Um, the, the people who invited me actually had that in mind before, before I, they didn't tell me about it. And so because I train a lot of doctors and because I do a lot to help educate folks online, they decided they wanted to give me this really, really awesome and wonderful award. So I'm just super excited. I'm super happy today and just happy to share that with you. Um, and I've said all that. And um, what I didn't do is I didn't make sure you could hear me. Now, my speaker, again, it tells me that I can hear you, but I'm, I'm using a different computer today, and it's not one that uh, I'm super familiar with. So uh, I want to make sure that you can hear me coming in loud and clear. I see several people joining in, but uh, nobody's chiming in and letting me know whether they can hear me or whether they can't. So if you can hear me, please go ahead and type in yes in your box. Write in a comment. Type in yes, I can hear you, Dr. Osborne, uh, and that way I can continue to go on and, uh, and and do this. And if you hear a little bit of background noise, it's because I've got a bird's nest right above me. I had to slip out of the faculty club here. So you're going to get honks in the background. You're going to get buses and other things going off because a lot of the students on the campus are, are moving from class to class and, and, uh, and there's a road right behind me. So anyway, welcome again to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. And so today I, I wanted to share part of what I shared with the audience today at the Harvard Faculty Club, which was a big part uh, the story of No Grain, No Pain and actually how it came to be, because many of you may not have heard this story, many of you may not know this story. I actually started practice over 16 years ago, and you know, part of my training earlier on in practice was I spent some time in the VA hospital. Uh, in particular, I spent time in the VA hospital in Houston uh, in the rheumatology department, learning rheumatology, learning the diseases, the arthritic diseases of, of autoimmune disease. So diseases like ankylosing spondylitis and Reiter's syndrome and psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma and dermatomyositis and lupus and reactive arthritis and migrating arthritis and polymyalgia and, and uh, even some uh, even some fibromyalgia. So um, if it's an autoimmune arthritis, I was trained in it very, very early on. And so one of the frustrations I had was that people were, were being prescribed steroids. They were being prescribed medications to offset the damage that the steroids re, would create. They were being prescribed non steroidal anti-inflammatories as well. So the problem with that was that the NSAIDs, the non steroidals like an, an example, if you've ever taken ibuprofen, you've taken a non steroidal But some of you have taken Mobic or Naproxen or Celebrex. These are all examples of non-steroidal based anti-inflammatories or sometimes referred to as NSAIDs. And these drugs destroy the gut lining. Actually, at very low doses, they've been shown to cause erosions in the mucosal barrier of the stomach and small intestines. Even aspirin does this at even at low doses, as low as seven and a half milligrams, which is a tenth of the size of a baby aspirin. So imagine a chronic autoimmune pain disease that you're being treated for with a non steroidal and this, you know, a year goes by, five years goes by, 10 years goes by, you're destroying your gut the whole time. These drugs also inhibit folate and they inhibit vitamin C and they inhibit iron. So these are nutrients that your body needs to form joints and to form new cartilage tissue. So taking a medicine to treat the pain that blocks the ability for the body to heal from the pain to me, it just didn't make a lot of sense. It was extremely ironic and, and sad. It was a sad paradox because these people were veterans. They were coming in to get help. And so knowing that the non steroidals damage the gut and then knowing that the steroids themselves actually, in some cases, could cause autoimmune disease. Some, in some cases, we see steroid-induced autoimmune disease of the kidneys or of the liver. 
But we also see steroid use cause bone loss. And, and one of the reasons why is steroids inhibit magnesium and calcium and vitamin D. So we get this, again, this drug nutrient interaction that occurs and it doesn't occur overnight. It doesn't occur if you took steroids one time 10 years ago. This is people who are on low dose steroids for years to try to manage the pain. This is, again, this, is, this was the tool belt that doctors had, had and still have to offer these chronic immune patients. And then beyond that, it was cancer drugs, anti-cancer drugs like methotrexate, which also caused leaky gut and destroyed the gut lining. And drugs like uh, Enbrel and some of the other biologics that, that are in, now in some cases injected um, or, or taken IV, and these drugs dramatically suppress the immune system to the point, it suppressed the immune system to the point that the biggest risk for long-term use of these medications is chronic infection and potential for cancer. So these drugs actually have a, a very clear warning on them that says these drugs can kill you. So that was, the, you know, again, that was what doctors in the VA hospital were using to treat these painful chronic autoimmune diseases. Um, these arthritis that, that would just basically destroy a person's life. And I get it. They were trying under the, under the, under the premise of compassion, they were trying basically to alleviate a person's pain. And, and, and so doing, they, you know, over a chronic period of time, they didn't solve why the autoimmune disease was there. And they also created a lot of drug induced side effects that led to a degradation of the disease. So it, it was very much a catch 22. I just didn't want to live in that catch 22 and practice in that catch 22 for the next, you know, 40 years of my life. I just felt like I, I was a bird trapped in a cage. I was miserable. I couldn't do nutrition. Uh, and I and I couldn't implement the things that I knew might help someone. And that's actually when I originally discovered in the medical literature, I spent hours, countless nights at the Jesse Jones Medical Library in Houston researching fat. And I talked about this last week, researching fasting and researching high dose fish oil and researching causation of autoimmune disease, things like gluten. We knew at the time gluten was the only actually known cause. Uh, for any any solid autoimmune disease, which in, in this case celiac disease, so we knew gluten could cause celiac disease, and so that was me in turning and being frustrated with the status quo. And so I went on into private practice. I, when I left the VA hospital, I went on into private practice. And one of my one of my very first patients in private practice was a little girl. She was nine years old, and you've, you've read my book, No Grain, No Pain. I wrote about her in the book, but her name was Ginger. She came to me after being told that she was going to die, they actually told her mom, they said, you need to prepare for your child. You need to prepare for her death. And they sent her home with no other viable solution. The medicines weren't working and they didn't know what else to do with her. So, you know, I wasn't the, I wasn't the first choice. Mom brought daughter in to see me, brought Ginger in to see me. And I, I certainly wasn't the first choice, but I was the only choice. I, they were choosing out of desperation. Uh, because all of the rheumatologists, and none of them believe that nutrition, or I shouldn't say none of them, I'm generalizing there, but a lot of them don't believe in nutrition at all, and none of them are really trained in nutrition. So, you know, coming from the realm of, of, of doctors who are trained traditionally to, to dispense medications, but not necessarily um, trained in any background of biochemistry or nutrition, you know, not only did they dismiss nutrition, as if it were unimportant, but they did so under the auspice that they were experts in it and had the ability or had the, the knowledge to say that. So to me, it was, it was, it was really quite tragic. It, it was really quite tragic, but she ended up in my office nonetheless. And, um, you know, if you imagine, imagine your own child, imagine this, imagine that your child has severe headaches every day. Imagine that your child, okay. Imagine that your child has chronic pain. Every time they eat, their stomach hurts. Imagine that their joints and their muscles have deep aching, just intense pain almost all the time. Imagine their knees swelling up to the size of golf balls. Imagine all of those things. Imagine that your child can't even play because the pain is so great, can't attend school because the pain is so great, can't live and function like a normal child because the pain is so great. And that was where Ginger was when her mom brought her in to see me. And you know, one of the big key elements was that she actually, her gut problems were actually caused by gluten. And her gut problems were actually the cause or the progenitor also of the autoimmune arthritis. It didn't take but a couple of months and we were seeing this young girl's pain dramatically reduce and go away. The headaches went away first, but eventually the, the joint pain completely went away. 
And, uh, and what ended up happening, of course, was a diet change saved this young girl's life. And so that was the progenesis or the progenitor to everything in my career from, from that point on. I don't know if I've ever shared that with you guys, but it was that little girl who I knew at that moment, how many people, there are 46 million people diagnosed, estimated in the United States alone with an autoimmune condition. And not all of them are as terminal as Ginger's case, but many of them live miserable lives. They're in chronic pain. They don't have a life. They, they're alive, but they don't have a life. They can't live because they're inhibited, because their bodies are broken. And, and 46 million people, I knew this message needed to get out to more. If we could save one life, we could save so many, many, many more lives. That's actually when I decided to create Gluten-Free Society. And I, so I found a gluten-free society, and a few years later, I wrote the book, No Grain, No Pain, to share this message and to deliver this information into the hands of the masses. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. And that's why I want all of you listening, gaining the wisdom and the knowledge of our, of our weekly sessions, to share that message with somebody you know, somebody you love who's suffering with autoimmune disease and struggling to find answers. Get them a copy of the book. Get a copy of the book and put it in their hands. Because if... if we can get this message to more people, we can save more people. Realize that I only have seen in my entire 16 year practice career, I've only seen about 5,000 patients. And in the next 16 years, I don't plan on stopping anytime soon, but in the next 16 years, if we double that, it's only gonna be another 5,000. And that's only 0.02% of the people who are suffering from chronic autoimmune problems. So 0.02% seems like a kind of it to me seems like a failure. It seems like an abysmal failure at an attempt to help the 46 million or the millions of people who are suffering with chronic autoimmunity and in need of real answers and in real, real need of solutions and, and, and the medicines aren't working and the doctors aren't talking about nutrition. So where else are they going to get the information? So that's the show story that I got to share uh, here at, at, uh, at the Harvard Faculty Club. And again, uh, I was presented with this just beautiful award from the good folks here. And uh, so again, I'm just super excited. So wanted to share that with you today. Um, and then I also wanted to take just a free live Q&A today. Many of you have chimed in. I can see uh, uh, Chris, Mindy Bennett are, are in. Tracy Elizabeth says, hi. Hi, Tracy. Um, Christina Espinoza is chiming in. Hi, hi Christina. All right. Um, <laughs> Tracy Elizabeth's birthday. Happy birthday. Um, so here's, let's just dive into some of the questions here. Can I take foods as a probiotic? Okay, great question because um, many people will dive into the yogurt or the kefir, these kombucha tea drinks that are being made and sold in stores all over the place. I don't recommend those as fermented foods because for several reasons. One, they ferment those with sugar. And we don't know the source of the sugar. And most likely, it's going to be some form of genetically modified sugar, uh, corn sugar or cane sugar. So there's the potential for glyphosate in it. But there's also, you know, the fact that when you feed bacteria garbage uh, and food that's not, not healthy, you, that's what you're getting back. That's what you're getting back out of it. So just I, I don't recommend those. Now, foods that you can use as probiotics, uh, number one, any salt fermented food. So, so things like sauerkraut. Uh, or kimchi, things like fermented cauliflower, fermented carrots or pickles, if they're salt fermented, uh, perfectly okay to use and try to get some of your probiotics in that way. One of the other really good ways to get probiotics is to garden, is to dig in the dirt. Another good way is to have an animal, have a dog, have a pet, and make sure you pet them regularly. Um, those are great ways to get soil microorganisms that are very, very beneficial to humans. And so, um, you know, that that hopefully takes care of that question. Again, don't recommend the fermented foods if they're fermented with the sugars uh, because bacteria, uh, you know, bacteria need a healthier food than that. All righty. Hi, B. Uh, Janine says hello. Hi, Janine. Let's see. I was taking Vicodin many years for pain but got right eating organic foods and limit sugar. It's so amazing. Well, that's just a great testimonial, Christina. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Lucille, all the way from Mexico. Hi, Lucille. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Wanda Moss from Tennessee. Uh, Marion from Florida. Uh, okay, Donna Newell. Thank you, Donna. Congratulations. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. 
and Sharon, thank you for your congratulatory uh, comment as well. I appreciate that. So I'm going to give you guys a few minutes because I'm going to go back in. Uh, there's still give there's still a few speeches that are going on, and I, again, I didn't want to break away and be rude. I want to go back in there. Uh, but I wanted to take a moment out to answer any questions. And I'll be back regular time again uh, next week. And uh, so if you've got any questions, now's the time to ask them. I'm going to give you about a minute to get those typed in before I tune out and sign out for the day. And while I am waiting, the weather here in uh in cambridge is it couldn't be better yesterday we were getting rained on but today it's just beautiful it's gorgeous outside the sun is shining uh and the birds are absolutely chirping all right here we go we're getting a few questions coming in okay ginger says diagnosed celiac 20 years ago high dose prednisone for two years now on long term five milligrams a day um now diagnosed with Parkinson's and also have diverticulitis. I'm going to get your book and looking into fermentation of my own foods, trying to cut out sugars. Hello from Alaska. Hi, Ginger, all the way from Alaska. I'm honored that you're tuning in. Um, yes, absolutely. If you were diagnosed with celiac 20 years ago, you've got to get grain free as fast as possible. Um, so get a copy of the book and dive into chapter seven and eight first. Those are gonna get you um, some, some uh, head start on the diet and the diet and the rules and the different kind of rules that you want to follow with the diet. Uh, Vicki, I am seriously addicted to sugar, can kick it off for a couple of weeks and feel much better and then go right back to it each time. It's harder to kick. Any advice? Yeah, Vicki, get yourself an accountability person. Um, you've got to have an accountability partner if you're fighting a chronic addiction. And the other thing you can do, I mean, because addiction is a very hard thing to beat is declare it. Declare your addiction, declare it to the world, declare it to the people around you, and declare that you are going to be moving in that direction. And that way, um, people around you can help hold you accountable for your declaration. So sometimes one of the easiest ways to beat an addiction is to declare that you have it and to let other people know your intention of beating it. But then the other thing is get a partner. Just like Alcoholics Anonymous, there's usually a sponsor, right? And, and uh, get yourself a sugar sponsor uh, because that that in and of itself, um, again, might be invaluable. Now, from a nutritional perspective, uh, the less you eat sugar, the less, you're, the less you crave it. But B vitamins oftentimes, uh, B vitamin deficiency will cause craving of sugar. So have somebody, have your local doc check your B vitamins. And, uh, and make sure your levels aren't low, especially vitamin B3, niacin. Niacin deficiency will make addiction extremely hard to kick. You've got to have enough niacin. And that's sometimes, even if you're not deficient, taking niacin um, in higher doses can be extremely helpful. Um, now, niacin, vitamin B3 is one of those, and it will give a flush. So when you take it, it will cause your blood vessels to dilate, and it will make your skin super hot. And uh, as it's making your skin hot, it'll turn red and it'll look like you have patchy, splotchy marks. And, and it, for some people, it freaks them out and they get scared. Don't let that scare you. That flush passes within about 30 minutes. Now, you might not want to take niacin if you're getting ready to go to a party or you're getting ready to go be social. Because if you start flushing in the middle of that social gathering, uh, people are going to be asking you all about it. And, and, and uh, it's just not going to be super comfortable. So... Let's see here. What minerals and vitamins do sugars disrupt? So, again, mention B3, mention B vitamins. Um, as far as minerals are concerned, the biggest is magnesium. Magnesium, sugar, sugar consumption will completely drain your magnesium levels because in order for you to metabolize sugar, you need magnesium. There's actually 16 different steps in the breakdown of sugar. Eight of them require magnesium. But if you're eating sugar without magnesium, then you're you're actually raping your body's storage of magnesium to process that sugar into energy. So people become extremely magnesium deficient and that leads to mood swings and irritability and sugar cravings because your brain thinks you need energy because you're, you're eating sugar and you're using up all your magnesium to process the energy, but you don't have any left to process other energy. So you become energy deficit. Your brain says eat more sugar or eat more sweet because we need more energy. Your brain is programmed to think that sweet is energy. So, but, but again, sugar without magnesium is a horrible idea. Zinc deficiency can also happen very aggressively with a with an abundance of sugar. So you want to make sure that um, that you, again zinc being very important because zinc is necessary for about 200 different chemical reactions in the human body. Some of those reactions include immune function. Some of them include producing insulin, which is the hormone that regulates blood sugar. So the irony in that, right? The more sugar you eat, the less insulin you have. 
because of the less zinc, because sugar causes a zinc deficiency, and that zinc deficiency causes you to not be able to properly produce insulin. And then again, you get stuck in this very, very aggressive diabetic type cycle that uh, your blood sugar just, it just will not regulate. Okay, uh, next question. My friend has been experiencing a pain in the middle of her chest, just under her rib cage, sometimes after eating, but other times maybe in the middle of the night in the morning when she hasn't eaten. Can that be related to diet or gallbladder or liver? Yes, it can. And then oftentimes it is a gallbladder or a liver problem. Um, let's see here. There's another, there's another thing she might check into. So gallbladder and liver problems can definitely create it. And some of the lab tests for gallbladder and liver dysfunction aren't super accurate. So you don't get real, um, you don't get always a positive result on the test when you're looking for those types of problems. Um, there's some simple things that can be done here. One is a gallbladder flush, which is where you take high doses of, of oil combined with, uh, with Epsom salt or magnesium salt and citrus juice. And that will actually stimulate your gallbladder to flush. And if there are any kind of sludge or any kind of stones in the gallbladder, those things will be pushed out through this process. Um, so that's one thing that's relatively easy and inexpensive to do. Um, and if the pain goes away, then, then you're right. And if the pain doesn't go away, then you went through some, some uh, pretty heavy bowel movements, but no harm, no foul. Uh, the other thing that might be and I see this very, very common in people, is, is they have a rib dislocation. They have a rib head out. And so the best person to, to really probably diagnose that would be a chiropractor. So have her, have her visit her chiropractor or go to a chiropractor uh, um, and, uh, and just check her ribs and the articulations and the way that her ribs connect to her spine because sometimes that will create that same kind of problem. Uh, Marion's chiming in. Uh, do grains add into the problem with fibromyalgia? Absolutely, they do. I have seen countless cases of fibromyalgia go into complete remission as a result of a grain-free diet. So to answer your question, yes. Now, that being said, are grains the only problem in cases of fibromyalgia? No. There are other reasons that people can develop fibromyalgia, and grain is one of them. But, but again, there are others. I've seen cases of Lyme infection where, where we were getting a neurological um, abnormality that was creating or triggering uh, the, the abnormal pain sensation in fibromyalgia patients. I've seen vitamin and mineral deficiencies, especially, again, going back to magnesium, but magnesium deficiency is notorious for being uh, present in those that have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So it, it's not just it's not just grains. There are other things, but yes, definitely grains play a big, big role or can play a big, big role in, uh, in the fibromyalgia pain that people experience. Okay, looks like I've got everything answered that's come in so far. So I'm going to wrap it up today a little bit early. Thanks, everybody, for, for being here. And, and thanks for all your congratulatory uh, words. It's, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be here. And I'm just happy that I can share part of this with you. And I will see you next Friday on Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Have a great day.